السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين We praise Allah سبحانه وتعالى We thank him for absolutely everything he's given us He's given us much more than we think he has given us Many times we don't even think that Allah's blessed us with millions and billions of things that our minds have not even thought of so we thank him for all those things and we are guilty of not being thankful sometimes and we send blessings and salutations upon Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he who was chosen by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to come to us with all the goodness and to, to teach it to us and there was a chain of uh, people who were used in order for the deen and the goodness and the religion and the kindness and all the beautiful teachings to get to us we send blessings and salutations upon all of them and we ask Allah to bless us and to help us to learn the deen, to put it into practice and to convey it to the next generations. Amen. Amen. I start off by saying, may Allah forgive me and forgive all of you. Amen. Amen. May Allah forgive our shortcomings, the things we know we've done, the, the sins we know we have committed. May Allah forgive us for them. We admit them. We regret them. We promise never to do them again and we ask Allah to forgive us. The sins that we do not know that we've committed, may Allah forgive us. There are certain sins that we would perhaps take for granted. We won't even think that this was a sin because it becomes the norm sometimes in society is such that when the environment uh, becomes upon a certain level that is lower than the level of the deen and the teachings of Islam, sometimes as you're walking, you don't realize the sins you're committing. And sometimes things like backbiting become such a norm that we tend to gossip. We get free minutes in Hong Kong, mashallah, one of the cheapest places on earth. It's the only place where I entered the hotel and they had a complimentary mobile phone saying you can make free international calls unlimited. You can have free internet unlimited. You can use this phone unlimited throughout Hong Kong until your stay ends at this hotel. And I'm like, what? Initially when I entered, I thought somebody had forgotten their mobile phone. <laughs> <laughs> and then when I read the note, wallah, I'm not joking. I was shocked. It's a six-star hotel. Why? One more star, the mobile phone. <laughs> I think they know that everyone likes to be on WhatsApp and everyone likes to have their phones up. Look at that, mashallah. Everyone likes to have the phone up and, you know, doing their thing, so to speak, whilst we're busy talking, subhanAllah. My brothers and sisters, you can see I'm delighted to be standing in front of you. I had yesterday a session with a lot of you. Uh, there are quite a few new faces here, mashallah. I can actually pick up the new faces because yesterday I looked very, very hard into the faces of the brothers who were seated here. Notice I said brothers, guys. <laughs> okay, so subhanallah. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy for us. Today we're going to be speaking about a topic and I'm going to use the same system as yesterday. Do you remember the system we used yesterday? What was it? Interactive. Interactive. Completely from the beginning to the end. I want to talk to you and I want you to talk to me. You have to tell me more about the same topic. So what is the topic? Anyone knows? No. Anyone knows? Preparation for tomorrow, today. Which means I'm preparing for tomorrow, today. And that's what we need to speak about. Because all of us would like to prepare for tomorrow. Uh, what is the punchline? W what have we started with? What is it that will keep us uh, speaking? Or what should we keep speaking around? What is it that will keep us as uh, a point of focus, inshallah, the, as an objective? It's a verse of the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Hashr, Ya amanu What's the meaning of that? Someone put up your hand, please. No. Yes. Correct. Fear Allah is one translation. Ittaqullah. I prefer uh, be conscious of Allah. That's that's a far deeper meaning than fear Allah. You know. Because fear could mean khawf, you know, and taqwa is actually a different type of fear and hope and love and worry and concern all mixed together at the same time. All of it together makes up taqwa. So taqwa is to create a barrier between you and jahannam, which means hellfire. To create a barrier between you and hellfire in such a way that you obey Allah's instructions and you stay away from his prohibitions. That's taqwa. So all you who believe, sorry, the reason why I said it was inaccurate is because 
You answered right, but I think you jumped the gun out of excitement. Am I right? So you didn't say, oh, you who believe. Be conscious of Allah. Each one of you should look into very carefully what you have prepared for presentation tomorrow. Right? So what have you prepared for presentation tomorrow? Put up your hands and tell me. What is being spoken about firstly? Tomorrow means what in this verse? The hereafter, when you meet with Allah, the day of Qiyamah, when we are going to be sitting with, or when we are going to be standing in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, answering for our deeds, what we did in the past, in, in this life. So Allah says, be conscious of Allah and just prepare for an answer on, on the day that you're going to be asked about every single thing. And one of the good ways of uh, helping yourself to prepare for tomorrow is to seek forgiveness. Did you know that? That's why I started off the session by saying, Allah, forgive me. And I was quite serious about it. We weren't joking. You know, there was no smile on my face when I said that. Did you notice? Yes. It's a fact. Oh Allah, forgive me. Really, I'm a criminal. What I mean is, I've done so many things that, that are wrong in my life. I don't mean major items like, you know, but I'm talking of so many minor things that add up to a major thing. You know, the hadith says these minor sins can add up to something big. You know, you need to be careful of continuing in a minor sin. Don't just say a minor. It's a minor matter. Don't worry. It's a minor matter. Those minors become major, man. You know, poke yourself with a pin. It's minor, isn't it? And keep poking yourself with a pin. Same place. What happens? It becomes big, tetanus and so on. And they've got to amputate your hand then. But what was it? It's just a pinprick. Minor, isn't it? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. So let's understand, you need to prepare for tomorrow, so do I. So when do I prepare for tomorrow? Tomorrow or now? Now. So what do we have? We have uh, this verse of the Quran that is the biggest motivation, if you ask me, for me. And there is another verse that motivates me as well. And that is a verse in Surah At-Tahreem, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu. Again, O you who believe. Save yourselves and your family members from the fire. And this is for the believers, those who believe in the hereafter. Those who believe that after death there is some form of accountability regarding what we were doing in this life. So Allah says, oh you who believe, save yourselves and your family members from the fire. Encourage each other to do good, discourage bad. Be focused on a goal that is further, not just today. Today you want to achieve something out of your lusts or desires. If that is a temporary item that will result in the wrath of Allah or the anger of Allah, cut it and drop it. It's not worth it. Ask those who've committed adultery in the past. They will tell you it was satisfaction for 10 minutes or for a day or a month. And after that, it was doom and gloom for a long, long, long time. I've spoken to Girls, for example, who've asked for help because they are pregnant from people that they cannot admit. They can't even speak to their own parents. Unwanted, or should I say teenage pregnancies. And they'll tell you, you know what? It was only 10 minutes. Or some will say, I just went out with him for about a month maximum. And look at this. Now suffering. The guys run away. Whatever has happened has happened. But... Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us that these temporary pleasures, be careful of them. There is a way of pleasing yourself whilst pleasing Allah. And there is a way of pleasing yourself in the displeasure of Allah. The latter is unacceptable. Remember this. It comes with a lot of pain. You know, I know, for example, the music that we have today on the globe, right? The musical industry or the music industry. The basic songs, basic. When I was a kid, you know, basic songs were just, hoo, 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 hoo. have you heard that? <laughs> Allahu Akbar. Astaghfirullah, astaghfirullah. Those were back, in, back there. It's not like I was a part of a band, my brothers and sisters. <laughs> but I just remember these little things random. At, we were at school and I know as you grow up in the assemblies, they used to sing and whatever used to happen. Not to say we participated in it, but it rings a bell sometimes, right? But today, the lightest of songs speak about something dirty. They invite you towards Satanism. They invite you towards evil. The Christians are against it. The Jews are against it. Anyone with religion and morality and values are against it. They don't want their children to be a part of this industry at all. Do you know that? 
What about the Muslims? You told well in advance, be careful, it's part of the, the band of the devil, watch out. And we say, no, no, nothing's wrong. That, that guy, you know, he's, he's an extremist, man. You know, he, he tells you not to listen to music, relax. What we are saying is, when something is dirty, stay away from it. The same applies to dress code. We say the freedom of a woman, subhanallah. That freedom of a woman, what is it exactly? Is it freedom when you strip a woman naked for all the eyes of the men to just enjoy? And this is why you have a lot of the designer clothings. The name belongs to a man. He's the one who cut the clothing and decided what you will do and happily enslaved you. But because you have a PhD, you feel he hasn't enslaved me. He has. But he's conferred you with a doctorate in enslavery. Allahu Akbar, or in, in enslaving. May Allah forgive us. So we don't realize we've become sex objects. That's exactly what it is. Objects of sex. Today when we talk about pleasure, when we talk about love, the word love automatically nowadays translates into sex and the bed. Have you thought of that? Everyone's quiet because you're shocked that I actually said it. Am I right? It's a fact. There's no need to hide. It's a reality. Today when someone says, I love you, it means, hey, I just want to see what you like in bed. That's it. That's what it is. Half the time they got no clue what love is all about. Yes, when you have parental love, when you have the spouse who loves you, yes, it's different. MashaAllah, SubhanAllah. So love has a deep meaning. A lot of it today translates, translates as lust. But we don't know the difference because we want everything quick, urgent, now. I need it today. We, can, we are impatient. If you want preparation for tomorrow, it starts off with a seed. In order to plant the seed, you need level ground. In order to level that ground, you will need to perhaps work on it for a while. You know, I recall a friend of mine was explaining to me, and he was a farmer. His family was, uh, you know, a group of farmers, or they, they belonged to a group of farmers. And when we were at school, he was telling me that, you know, when you get a piece of land, in order to prepare it, to be able to uh, cultivate, you might spend two whole years just, you know, taking out the trees and the boulders and the rocks and, and, and so much of investment and money. And then you can actually soften the, the, the soil and everything's ready to, just to plant the seed. And then he says, you plant the seed and then you have to wait. Because initially, it's very, very tricky because... Uh, in, at that early stage, the pods and whatever grows initially can, can be destroyed much quicker and more easily than if it were to be a little bit stronger and a little bit bigger. So he was explaining to me, and I thought to myself, subhanallah, we as Muslimin, we have the preparation for the Akhirah. Don't think for a moment that, you know what, it's just uh, one day I'll be very pious and I'll read my five salah a day and I carry on leading my life and I tell myself, the one day I was very pious, I'm going to heaven. The one day I read my salah, I'm going to heaven. It's a dedication. It's something you need to better yourself. You need to become a person who speaks well, who speaks with good language to everyone. Do not become a person who is rough. Do not become a person who is, uh, for example, even if you have improved yourself, but just for a day, for a week, for a season, you know. That, that's not going to help you. If you want to prepare for tomorrow, change your whole life and become a person whose steps that are taken will be steps in the right direction all the time, not going back. This is why one of the biggest failures is when a person improves and then they go back on their improvement. So you used to read three salah a day, right? And then you, you, you go to four and then you go to five. And mashallah, that's a big achievement, am I right? Very big. And suddenly you drop down back to two or three or, or four. Why did you go back? You know, you used to be a person who used to dress semi-naked and then you realize that at least I need to dress modestly. I need to, I need to be a, a, a dignified, reasonable person who's not just judged by uh, what I show because there will come a day when I won't really have that much to show. SubhanAllah. <laughs> May Allah safeguard us. You know, if you're really a mother and you, and you really have a spouse who's, who's married you because of who you are and not because of what you look like, he will respect you till the day you die because he knows I love you and I love you because of who you are, not because of what you look like. If anyone marries you solely and only based on what you look like, your looks and their looks will over time change to say the least. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help us, to guide us. But a person who goes back on their achievements, say a person starts dressing modestly, they start, you know, preparing for tomorrow in the sense that, you know, I would like to. 
Something's just come to my mind, I'll tell you just now. But I, I would like to earn the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and so on. And, and suddenly one day they go all the way back and they zoom back into the nightclub and they're drinking alcohol. Astaghfirullah. That's called al-intikasa. It's called in the Arabic language, al-intikasa. Or al-hawr ba'd al-kawr. And the Prophet ﷺ used to say, Oh Allah, protect me from al-hawr ba'd al-kawr. You know, to go back after, you, after we had achieved, to take a step backward. No, we need to be able to take steps forward. And this is why sometimes in our excitement, we become such that we want to, you know, we become so pious that it's actually a sin. What does that mean? Can anyone explain? Extreme, extreme meaning I'm reading so much salah that now my kid is dying and he needs the hospital. And I'm saying Allahu Akbar. And I think I'm pious. Hang on. What is important right now is to take your child to the hospital, to take your wife, for example, to the clinic or to do something that is far more important at this particular juncture than voluntary and extra prayers. Does it make sense? This is what we mean. Piety is not connected to just standing and doing in, in prayer five times a day. Uh, or should I say five times a day is obviously obligation, but it's, it's, it's limited to the farad and the rest of it is, is voluntary. Or should I say there, is, there are different levels. But if you're standing all day and you're fasting all day and you don't want to uh, uh, fulfill the needs of the rest of your family and those who are under your authority, then you fall under the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ where he speaks about uh, or he confirms what Salman al-Farisi was telling Abu Darda And do you people know the hadith? Anyone know roughly what it was? Anyone know what it was? You cannot tell me you don't know. Two guys know? Anyone else know what happened between Salman al-Farisi and Abu Darda? Anyone know? Three guys. Anyone else know? Four. Inshallah, next time the whole lot of you will know. Do you know why? Because I'm about to tell it to you. <laughs> okay. What happened is when the Prophet, peace be upon him, got to Medina Munawwara and th th there was a, a crisis in the sense that there were all these people who made the hijrah who, were, who didn't have a place to go to, uh, the, he, he fostered a relationship of brotherhood between the people of Medina and the people of Makkah. So every family had to take in one family. So if they were 100,000 families, 100,000 refugees were dealt with at once. But they were never ever called refugees. Did you notice that? They were called Muhajireen. Subhanallah, what a beautiful name. Today when we say refugee, everyone thinks, oh, this guy's low, like, you know, he's completely out of, out of the equation. He's just a refugee. He's here by chance, you know, by chance and for a temporary time and so on. May Allah forgive us. So, so they were paired. So Salman al-Farisi, who happened to be paired with Abu Darda radiallahu an, he notices that Abu Darda radiallahu an, he, his wife was not keen at all in anything, no dressing up, no, you know, she was not even bothered to be speaking to him uh, in, in a certain way and all sorts. So, so he asks her, what's the problem? What's the matter? You know, this husband-wife uh, relationship, there's something. And this teaches us that when we notice within our friends something of this nature, w within the limits of the Sharia, we should get involved in order to solve the matter. It's an act of worship to say, my sister, don't do this. And please don't give advice. You know, I remember there was a lawyer once. Uh, a friend of mine went to him and said, you know, I need you to represent me because of this. Uh, they're accusing me of this crime and we need to go to the court. And the lawyer says, just plead guilty. It's easier than for me to come. <laughs> I'm like, what's going on? He says, just plead guilty. But what do you mean? No, it's just a $20 fine anyway, or whatever it was. And you know, if you're going to, he says, what are you talking about? I'm asking you to represent me because I'm innocent. So the moral of it is sometimes people just tell a woman that, you know what, just get a divorce, it's over. That advice is wrong. If that was the starting point, it's wrong. Yes, if there was something serious that happened and someone beat you up and someone, you know, you were black and blue and you came, then we would tell you, come, let's go away. No man should be beating a woman. Not at all. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala safeguard us. But I have to say, no woman should be beating a man. <laughs> Because I'm a marriage counselor and I, I, I do know. I'm a marriage counselor and I've come across a lot of cases of late where the guy comes beaten up and, <laughs> and he's too embarrassed to admit that you know what, I've been beaten up by my spouse. So it goes both ways. This is not allowed and that's not allowed as well. But the, the point I'm raising is if someone gives you advice to say just break your marriage, that, that's not an act of worship. 
If that was a starting point, you just said, ah, break your marriage, break your marriage. You're breaking everybody's marriage. Work on it. Everyone goes through some form of turbulence. Marriage will have to struggle with a little bit of turbulence. And your test is to see the durability, how long or how much you will be able to do. Because I know of people who've struggled for five years, seven years, and after that, house on fire. Wow. So much that the house was burnt down. MashaAllah. May Allah grant us goodness in our homes. Remember, if you sacrifice, you're ready to sacrifice, you will definitely be able to achieve. So Abu Darda radiallahu anhu, he, 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 he was asked by Salman al-Farisi radiallahu anhu, he says, in fact, as Salman al-Farisi notices that at night, this man gets up in prayer and he's praying all night. So he says, you know what? Stop. Go back to sleep. He was offended. He says, you're stopping me from praying. I'm going back to sleep. You're telling me to go back to sleep. He says, yes, go to bed. I'm telling you, go to bed. So he went to bed. A little while later, he notices Salman is gone. He gets up and he wants to pray again. Salman was watching. He says, go back, go to bed. And this happened a few times. And then when there was a last portion of the night remaining, Salman gets him up and says, hey, you can now come and pray. So he was praying and then Salman says, you know what? I just want to teach you something. Your wife has a right over you. Your body has a right over you. Your organs have a right over you. Your family has a right over you. So you need to fulfill every right. Don't just be lopsided, one-sided. You just do one thing and you ignore the rest of the rights. So he said, okay. And in the early morning, he, early morning, Abu Darda goes to the Prophet, peace be upon him, and relates the story and says, you know, Salman stopped me from praying. He told me to go back to bed. And he did this. And he did that. And, and at the end, he told me the story. The Prophet says, Sadaqa Salman. Salman spoke the truth done. From that we learn. Now do you know the story of Salman? Put up your hand. <laughs> so from this we learn that you know you need to fulfill the rights of every... It's an act of worship to go to bed with the right person. Did you ever think of that? <laughs> it's an act of worship. The Prophet peace be upon him said it clearly, more clearly than I just said it now. He says, Fi budu'i ahadikum sadaqa. You know, he says it's it's a rewardable deed if you were to go to bed to be intimate with your spouse. So the Sahaba were, they questioned him. They said, Ya Rasulullah, you mean, you know the wording that's used, I can't even use it in the English language, okay? He says, you mean, you know, we're intimate with our spouses and we get a reward for it? He says, okay, if you were to place, if you were to, for example, be intimate with the, with the wrong person, would you get, uh, or would such a person get a sin? They said, yes. So he said, so if you were to do it with the right person, you would be rewarded. Similar. Amazing. Amazing. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us and may he open our doors. So the Prophet sallallahu here, what a beautiful teaching. If we would like to prepare for tomorrow, this balance is absolutely necessary. Because today on the globe, there is a lack of balance. People are either on one extreme or on the other. We either have people who are not bothered about pre preparation for the hereafter or we have others who are preparing in a wrong way. They want to oppress people. They want to, for example, not fulfill the rights of others. Do you know that the non-Muslims have a right over you? What is that right? Many rights. Who can tell me some of the rights that the non-Muslims have over you? Yes. If they are our neighbors, yes, we are able to tell. If, uh, and like Muslims, Okay, let's talk about the neighbor. Correct. Neighbor, Muslim or non-Muslim, you have to fulfill all their rights. No throwing rubbish on that side. No, you know, uh, no harming them in any way. Can someone tell me something else? Uh, allow the to worship. That's correct. The non-Muslims are entitled to worship whatever they, 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 they worship. Lakum dinukum waliyadin. That's the policy. You know, live and let live policy. And, and they are to worship whatever they worship without trampling on our toes and we do not trample on their toes and that's it what else say it again i didn't hear that mutual respect that is definitely there and we say mutual respect what else who can tell me Yes, good and bad, subhanAllah. We, we have to learn to respect one another, to reach out to one another. We have to understand that the behavior, the interaction of a Muslim with a non-Muslim should be such that by the time I am departing or I'm leaving them, they need to understand that at least this is a religion that is heavenly. It has some good teachings in it, minimum. And one thing I'm not supposed to do is interact with them in a way that when I go away, they have a bad image of who Muhammad, peace be upon him, was. 
Imagine uh, uh, someone comes to you and say they swear you, a non-Muslim swears you, and you swear back. But the fact is you know better and bigger swear words. So what happens is they look at you and they start thinking, mm, these guys, look at them. In actual fact, the image of Islam is being tarnished, not really you as a person, they probably don't even know who you are. So you need to go out the extra mile to ensure that the true image of Islam is portrayed. Because on the globe today, the wrong image is being portrayed. When you talk about Islam, you da 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 Am I right? That's Islam, according to the globe. There's shootings and killings and fightings and so on. But to be honest with you, that is definitely not what Islam teaches. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us a balance. Okay, let's, let's get deeper into the topic itself. Uh, in terms of preparation for tomorrow today, we have, say for example, our, ourselves. Can someone tell me about themselves? How have you prepared for tomorrow? Put up your hand and tell me. Whether it is tomorrow in terms of your education or in terms of the akhirah. Let's talk about both. In terms of something to do with this world or in terms of something to do with the hereafter. How have you prepared for tomorrow? Can I give you a bit of a hand? Look. We're, at, we're in a university here. Why are you here? Why do you go to school? Why? Why education? What's, the, what's so important about it? Yes? Your future opportunities are facilitated. Well done. So it means today, for 25 years, I go to school and I study and I pay in order to live another 25 years. Am I right? Then I retire and I hope I've got some money. Right? So we're preparing for, the, for 25 years, and it takes us 25 whole years to prepare for another, say, 35 years, if you're lucky, okay? But I, I, I said 25 because it might take you 10 years to look for a job, by the way. <laughs> so this is what it is. And that is something very important. We're not saying no. It's important. Yes, you go to school, you learn. But to be honest, there is a life now, and I need to prepare for another life that is to come, how long do you think it's going to take me to prepare for that life? An entire lifetime. You see the point? So who can tell me how best or how they have prepared for tomorrow? Tell me. No one wants to talk, I think. Tell me. Okay, let me word it differently. How can I prepare for tomorrow? Tell me. Allahu Akbar. I can keep on doing what I'm doing now, but there are a few things. You cannot keep on telling me to keep on doing what I'm doing now. <laughs> because we need to improve and we need to go. We need to move ahead. You know, we all need to move ahead. The sister was saying something. I've got a starting point. Yes. I try to learn from Quran and implement on my life. Alhamdulillah. I try to learn from the Quran and implement it in my life. I want to tell you what that boils down to. One of the biggest ways of preparing for tomorrow is to be conscious of your maker. We started off with that verse. Be conscious of your maker. One of the biggest ways of being able to prepare for tomorrow. And you will come to realize that your maker did not just only make you. He made your enemy as well. He made someone you don't like. That's also a creature of the same maker. He made the animals as well. Creature of the same maker. So as much as you will fulfill your rights towards your maker of prayer, of worship and so on, he expects you to fulfill the rights of his other creatures. Did you hear that? So if I see the other creatures of the Almighty, I need to fulfill the rights because tomorrow Allah is going to ask me, look, I made the ant. What did you, what did you do? For example, I can give you one simple example. You know the fish, you have fish uh, back at home. We have a fish called the tiger fish. I don't know if you've heard of it, right? So people go fishing and so on and they, they fish. They pick out this fish here and they lift it up and it, it's mashallah wobbling and it's you know almost dying and a little while later they take all their photographs and so on and when it's almost dead they throw it back into the water you see and it happens and they say it's just a sport and now they've discovered that well that's fine they don't mind the fish don't mind did you go and have a meeting with them or something you know <laughs> did you ask them guys do you mind and they say no no we don't mind you know <laughs> so Allah we are taught as Muslimin don't be cruel even to animals if you really need something to eat, you may, but in the most humane way that is taught by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Taking the name of Allah. Why taking the name of Allah? It's you seeking the permission of the giver of the life to say, what gives me the right to take the life away of this chicken? 
Because it was not me who gave the life. But in the name, in your name, O giver of the life, the purpose, there is a purpose here. And we, we would like to consume and we know you've allowed us and so on. This is the reason why you take the name of Allah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us and guide us. So be conscious of the Almighty. Another very interesting point. When it comes to your children, you need to be a role model. You need to be a role model. If you want to prepare for tomorrow, today, you need to cut your bad ways and habits. Because if you would like your child not to swear, you need to start off by eradicating swear words. You want your child to dress appropriately, you dress appropriately. You want your child to be uh, responsible, you be responsible. Wallahi, the most powerful way of teaching children is not through words, but by example. They will want to be like you, they will want to talk like you, dress like you, they will want to... I know, you know the prayers that we engage in, for example, one year old child wants to emulate, follow completely. They want to do the same thing, they'll stand with you, they'll cry to be like you. But do they understand? They can only say, ah, that's about it. They can only cry and perhaps laugh and that's it, yet. Nothing. No words yet. But subhanAllah, it's something amazing. So, if you want to prepare for tomorrow, today, regarding your children, change. What, what you would like to see from a child should be seen in you first. You follow? What you want to see in a child should be seen in you first. So your temper is something that will ruin the future of your kids to start with. I recall a story. I don't know how true it is, but I read it online. It was just a motivate, motivational story, so to speak, where they say there was a man who had bought a brand new vehicle and his little child had scratched the car with a rock, you know, brand new Mercedes Benz or whatever it was. They say I'm supposed to say Mercedes. Is that true? Is it Mercedes or Mercedes? Can someone correct me? Mercedes, Mercedes, we're all disputing. Okay. So long as you know the car I'm talking about. But I can tell you, I think it's Mercedes, to be honest. So, so, are we going to email them and ask them or something? <laughs> Okay, so, so the, 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 the car was scratched and the father comes out and beats up this little child of his such that the child was bleeding and so on and after a three or four days the child died. Dead. And guess what was written on the car? Scratched on the car. I love you, Dad. I love you, Dad. Okay, that's a story. True or not, Allah knows best. But the, the, it's touched us, right? Tell me something. If that dad knew that this is my child, innocent child, doing something. It's not like they're criminals and they're doing it intentionally. It's an innocent child. Let me correct the child, you know, no problem, it's okay, it's fine. You know, my wife told me that a few years back, when I had my first kid, or, you know, many years ago, when I had my children initially, right? Uh, <laughs> she says, I was a little bit more temperamental in the sense that I would, I would correct them for small things. You know, if we're in the vehicle, I would say, you know what, just make sure that you don't uh, leave marks on the window and on here and there. And guess what, right now, I don't mind. You can scrape an egg on my window and I'm like, hey, it's okay, you know, it's okay, leave them, you know. Because over time, sometimes Allah gives you children who are quite hyper in order to calm you down. I know my brother, quite a temperamental fellow, when he had his sons one after the other, he became a guy whose temper, actually you wouldn't believe if I told you how he was some time back. So it's through these kids that Allah has calmed you down a lot. But a winner is he who calms down without waiting for those kids. May Allah forgive me. Amen. I haven't done anything majorly bad. Don't worry. The way you guys are looking at me. <laughs> but subhanAllah, it's something interesting because if, if you would like to prepare for tomorrow, look, to be honest, I'm leaving the world. Two things I need to prepare for. Wherever I am going and whoever I'm leaving back behind. Does it make sense? I need to prepare for two things. Wherever I'm going is the biggest preparation that I need. And the second biggest thing is for me to prepare those whom I'm leaving behind to keep on living a life of decency. You know, people ask me, there's a big crisis. You know why? Because of ISIS. And I say, well, that's true because ISIS and crisis go together. <laughs> But the reality is, they ask you, what are you going to do about it? And I normally say, let's be realistic here, guys. I know as much about them as you do. And I have as much access as you do to them, meaning we don't have access at all, to be honest. I don't think they would even count us. But the reality is, 
We can start off by educating ourselves and our kids and reminding them of the beautiful, true teachings of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam so that such is not repeated. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. Does it make sense? So someone asked me, and wallahi, if I can't recall exactly where it was. Someone said, what are you doing about it? I said, well, I'm standing in front of you right now. That's part of what I'm doing. Why am I here? It's part of what I'm doing. We are trying to promote peace, goodness, tolerance, coexistence with difference. With difference meaning difference of opinion. If I differ with you, my brother, 20 matters, it does not mean I hate you. Get that straight. I differ with you. I, I disagree. But I love you for the sake of Allah. SubhanAllah. The one who made you made me. SubhanAllah. That's what it is. You have a right to believe that I, I raise my hands in salah just at the beginning and I have a right to believe that I'll raise my hands more than just at the beginning. That doesn't make you an evil person. It doesn't make the other guy an evil person. I don't need to get my gun out and say, hey, raise your hands or else, you know. But that's what we're doing. Sadly, that's what seems to be creeping in. You know why it's creeping in? Ignorance, I think. Ignorance. People don't know. You're being conned sometimes by people who come to you with a verse of the, you know, this is in the Quran, but you've never read the Quran, my brother. So you don't know. So when they tell you, here it is, verse number three, you know, chapter number so and so, so and so, and they put it in your face. You say, I'm a Muslim. Ooh, this looks quite, yeah, man, you know. But you haven't asked anyone. You, you don't even know the context in which this verse was revealed. You don't have reasons of revelations, no knowledge whatsoever. But you studied 50 big, big books every term at varsity to become a doctor. And guess what? You failed your final exam. And may Allah grant you guys all passes. I believe it's exam time right now. It's exam time? Yes. Inshallah, you pass. Say Amin. Amin. Oh, that was loud. That was very loud. <laughs> mashallah, mashallah. That was very loud. You know, I hope when I... There's a few things. When you ask for money, the Amin's loud always. When you, when you ask for... Uh, when you ask for a spouse, oh, the Amin is extremely loud. You know? And the funny part is even the married guy say, Amin. <laughs> what are you saying Amin for? <laughs> May Allah help us, really. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. So my brothers and sisters, that's the beauty. The beauty of this deen is that it's so balanced. Look, we, 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 we're here in this serious talk. But mashallah, it's, you know, it's light. Light in the sense that I can't shove something down your throat. We can share ideas. Perhaps I might be able to guide you a little bit in terms of revelation. But who knows, you can correct me as well. I'm just a human being. I can make a mistake, can't I? So there we are. May Allah help us. We said today that we need to be role models for our own children. Don't wait and say, I want my son to be like you. But you are not even here. You are somewhere far away. My son doesn't even know about you. Why doesn't your son want to be like you? Supposed to be that way. Allah has blessed you and bestowed upon you children. Ask those who don't have kids. May Allah bless them with kids as well. But subhanAllah, it's, it's, it's a responsibility and it's an opportunity to improve yourself for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Imagine you don't pray and you're asking Allah's help in order to make your son pray. Start yourself. You don't obey the instruction of the Almighty and you want your children to obey your instructions. So for me, if you were to ask me preparation for tomorrow, I would say, look back at the mistakes made perhaps by your own parents or by the environment or by the cultures that we may have been following look at the errors that are there look at what's wrong and do not repeat it with us the problem is we repeat these things and we just say my father did it i have to do it that's it your father made a big blunder you're going to repeat the blunder the answer is yes i have to <laughs> allah forgive us don't repeat the mistake you make the change. You be a person who stands up and wallahi you will have a following. If what you are doing is right, people will follow. And it's, we're not doing it because we want a following, but we're doing it because anyone who follows a good example, we get a full reward for it. Full reward for it. So lead by example and see what happens. The doors will open by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Today there's a lot of chaos on the globe. The minimum we can do, number one is to pray. That's definitely there. Number two is to educate ourselves and those around us to ensure that they're not lured by the same guys who are luring a lot of other people unsuspecting. To engage in that which is not befitting a Muslim. 
Another issue, yesterday someone raised the issue of intolerance amongst Muslims themselves. Intolerance. So what can we do about it? We can educate each other. We don't even tolerate sometimes our neighbors. In one masjid, don't you agree we've got so much intolerance? Do you agree? Look at how loud the yes was. There's a problem in Hong Kong, guys. The yes was so loud. I'm embarrassed. But it shows there's so much politics. We cannot tolerate a guy. I remember in the masjid, there was a huge fight in Ramadan, Taraweeh time, because of a fan. And I know why you guys are laughing. Because I'm sure that problem has happened not just where I come from. Do you agree? There you are. A fan, brother fan, a window, open the window. The Imam, you know, I read a little bit slower than the others. So we take about five, ten minutes uh, longer, you know, in, in prayer. And then the older guys are saying, no, you need to go to the Ferrari mosque. What's a Ferrari mosque? A Ferrari mosque, a Ferrari mosque you know. Ferrari mosque where the, the prayer is ended in five minutes and everyone's out and they're smoking outside, you know. Ah, whoa. Ferrari must. But to, to 10 minutes longer, no one wants to go there. Because why? That's a link with Allah. Shaitan makes you feel like, hey, these guys, they're going to take so long. If you look at the actual timing, it's only 10 minutes. Only 10 minutes. Subhanallah. Okay, I'd like to ask you guys another question. The reason why I didn't keep it as interactive as I promised at the beginning is because I saw that people might not have been so... Uh, delighted to share certain things which might be private, you know. When we say, how have you prepared? Maybe you might have felt, look, that's my own private thing, you know. Uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. But what I want to say, does anyone want to contribute in, in, in a motivating way or to give us their little experience, how they've helped themselves uh, to change, uh, to come towards Allah or to prepare for tomorrow? Like I said, whether it's worldly or whether it's to do with the akhirah, because these are the two things we're talking about. Uh, th those you leave behind as well as yourself while you're in this world, but more so for the Akhirah. Anyone wants to share with us their experience? Yes, sir. Bismillah. You started praying Fajr with, in Jama'ah. What motivated you? The brothers in your clique. Okay. The brothers in my university. That's a powerful point because I asked about preparing for tomorrow and he gave such a beautiful answer by saying, I started reading the early morning prayer and I asked him, what made you do that? And what did he say? Company. Company. That means if you'd like to prepare for tomorrow, one of the points is ensure that your company is right. Your friends, make sure the circle of friends are productive people and not counterproductive. Because if your circle of friends are always worried about achieving, achieving, you could achieve just with them. But if they're all lazy guys who are in the clubs and drugs and doing this and you know, hey guy, what's up, you know? And that's the only thing they're up to. What do you expect? You're going to be talking like them, you're going to be walking like them, you're going to be thinking like them and everything, your norm will be their norm because the hadith speaks about friendship. The Quran speaks about the effect and impact of friends. You know, يُعْرَفُ الْمَرْءُ بِخَلِيلِهِ A person is known by the company he keeps. You want to know someone? Don't ask about him. Ask about who he hangs out with. You probably get a better picture. <coughs> and he can't come and tell you that I'm the only guy who's decent in my whole lot of friends. Because no way. No way. So friendship, mashallah, it motivated the man. Read Salah. I know I've given an example in the past of how when you travel with a group of people who are not bothered about prayer and not bothered about so many other things, you find that you wouldn't be... Even if you are a person who prays, you might miss a prayer or two because of who you're with. And if you're not so regular with your prayer, but you go out with a group of people who actually pray, and, and, and you're traveling with them, they, they will stop and say, Alright guys, let's pray. And you, you, are you going to say, not pray? I mean, are you a woman or something? You let off or something? You know, what's going on here? <laughs> Allahu Akbar. May Allah forgive us. So we would find it easier to say, okay, let me just pray. Because everyone's praying. It's easier to do that. Okay, shukran. Thank you for that contribution. A sister wanted to say something here? Yes, in the blue there. Jazakumullah khair. The issue of repentance and seeking the forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Something powerful. Uh, when you, whenever you've made a mistake, you ask Allah's forgiveness. There are two types of mistakes. A mistake you make against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and a mistake you make against fellow human beings. It is far bigger. It is a far bigger worry when you make a mistake against fellow human beings. Why? 
because they may not forgive you. But Allah is all forgiving. Allah says you do something against me, like say for example you've uh, consumed alcohol or you've uh, gone into, you know, you've done something bad, adultery or so on. If you seek Allah's forgiveness, Islam is based on absolute forgiveness. So it means if you say, oh Allah, I regret what I did, I admit my sin, I won't do it again, and I ask your forgiveness. Allah says, your sin is wiped out. No doubt. There's no doubt. Four conditions met, your sin is gone forever, ever. Never to be brought up again. Out. No confessions. No confessions to be made to any creatures of Allah. You confess to Allah alone in the darkness of the night or at any time. So there Allah says, I'll forgive you. The conditions are met. But if you have stolen the money of someone else, you return it. You say, hey, can you forgive me? He might say, no ways. I'm not forgiving you. Then what? So Allah says, Allah is Ghafoorul Rahim. He's most forgiving, most merciful. And these are beautiful words that are used. But the people are not Ghafoorul Rahim. They are not most forgiving, most merciful. So be careful. You do something, learn to say, I'm sorry. Learn to apologize. Learn to make amends. Because even the Quran speaks about how to make amends before a day comes when uh, the wealth won't help you. You won't be able to use your money in order to get your freedom. They would... On the Day of Judgment, there's no fine that is to be paid by cash. Not at all. It's a penalization of a different nature. Shukran for that input. Yes, the sister there, somewhere, uh, who was it there on this side? Yes, sister in, in the purple and black, yeah? Subhanallah, can I ask you a question? What time do you go to bed? Is that like a cut-off point? Okay, Jazakallah. There's a reason I ask. Did you hear what she said about tahajjud, which is, the, which is a voluntary prayer in the last part of the night? You get up on your own when everyone is asleep and, 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 and you try to, to please Allah. And I appreciate the input because we're all trying to get there, mashallah. We're trying. And, and I tell you, one of the most interesting points is a lot of that depends on the discipline regarding what time you go to sleep. If you, if you make sure you're disciplined regarding your sleeping times, and you sleep at 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock, you know, depending on your time zone and what type of work is, uh, you, you, what type of country you're in. Automatically, your eye will open half past three. Wow, eye open. What time does Fajr start? Quarter past four, right? Quarter past four, here and now, I'm talking of like today. If you're up at half three, quarter to four, you can go and make your wudu and you can, you know, wash yourself and start praying just before the time of Fajr comes in and you've done your tahajjud, subhanallah. Can I tell you what the problem is? Sometimes Allah wants us to improve or He wants us to reach out to Him or to call out to Him. And because we're not doing that, sorry, He taps us. What type of a tapping? Some form of calamity comes, some form of struggle comes, so we start praying. We never used to pray before, but now I've got a big problem, major issue, man. You know, financial disaster. I'm, I, I owe someone, suddenly someone stole $50,000 of mine. And I'm raising my hands and I'm crying to Allah. But where were you before? I never used to pray before. That's the mercy of Allah. He's brought you through. It costed 50, 50 grand, right? $50,000, but you were brought through. And then what happened? You get up for salat to tahajjud because you really need help. And you cry and you start and you develop a beautiful link with Allah. Let that not end when your crisis is over. And this is why people say, why is it that I'm praying for so long and nothing's happening? Your people say that sometimes. Can I tell you why? Sometimes Allah loves the condition you're in. He wants to keep you in that condition for slightly longer. Trust me, it's a fact. Because if we dedicate to Allah to say, even when my problem is solved, I'm going to carry on worshipping this way, perhaps it would be resolved here and now. Done. But subhanAllah, if you discipline yourself regarding sleep, you'll be able to get up for this voluntary prayer. That is preparation for tomorrow. It is, and wallahi, I invite you guys, firstly, to start off with your five prayers. Don't miss it, come what may, no matter what. Even if you're busy sitting on a chair and you cannot move because of exams or whatever, you do your prayers where you are. Make sure you have your wudu and you read your prayer. May Allah help us all. Shukran. Yes, brother. Uh, sorry, the one behind you. MashaAllah, transformation he's talking about and how he's benefited from YouTube and how, uh, you know, uh, learning from the different scholars. To be honest, we're living in an age where everything is available online, good and bad. It's up to you to use it in the right direction. Because to be honest, so many people are using it for bad. Have you seen statistics on pornography? Some of the Muslim countries are leading in terms of those who watch pornography. It's sad. It's very bad. But to be honest with you, 
We need to change that. We need to make sure that we use it for the right reasons. We use it for the right reasons. Wherever you've fallen, quickly get up and walk in the right direction once again. Don't leave yourself down. Look, we're talking today. We're motivating. So get up. Do the right thing and stay on that path. The path of goodness. So thank you for sharing that with us. That's another invite from the brother to all of us. Make good use of the internet. I think in Hong Kong it's very cheap, right? Extremely cheap, right? You know where I come from? For two gigabytes, we pay 50 US dollars. Did you hear that? Without a joke. Two gigabytes, 50 US dollars. That's in Zimbabwe. Did you hear what I said? And that also, it's as slow as a tortoise compared to Hong Kong. Yeah. I need to refresh my page so many times so half the gigs are gone just in all, in all that. Man. Shift to Hong Kong. <laughs> the day I learn Mandarin, mashallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. I wouldn't shift here just for the internet. Come on, guys. <laughs> Okay, uh, anyone else wants to share the sister in the yellow there? Yes, brilliant, mashallah. Did you hear that? So this is motivation. The question I have listening to the sister, may Allah strengthen you and your friends. How many of us participate in a group of people doing good activity? No matter what it is. How many of us go out and visit uh, hospitals? In fact, can you show me with a show of hands how many go out and visit hospitals regularly to see the sick people? I don't mean visit hospital because, <coughs> but I mean to see other people. And do you know what? There are a few, okay, mashallah. Do you know what the Prophet, peace be upon him, says? He speaks about how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say, Oh, son of Adam, I was sick and you did not visit me. And son of Adam will say, How could you have been sick when you are Rabbul Alameen? And he says, Didn't you hear of so and so being sick and ill? Well, had you visited them, you would have found me there. So the importance given to visiting the sick in Islam is huge. But the problem is a lot of us take it for granted because we don't realize how it's going to help me. And we say, ah, that guy, I don't even know them. I don't. You know what? You can take a walk and you can actually just greet a few people. See, sometimes just send a message. People are sick and ill. Send them a message to make a dua, a prayer. It boosts them. Half the people get better based on, you know, how they're feeling. They, you know, uh, they, they feel very emotionally good and so on. And they start psychologically, they, they better. And that helps them a lot. Jazakumullah khair. Thank you for sharing that. We all need to get involved, inshallah, some form of activity because before you know it, life is over. Yes, someone else wants to share something at the back there? Yes, the sister there with the glasses. Sorry to say with the glasses, but that's the way that... She, she's talking of the hijab and how she started it at school and so on. And subhanallah, it must be quite difficult because to be honest with you, it's not easy to don the hijab. And a lot of people have a wrong perception of it. A lot of people think, oh, you're oppressed and so on. Uh, you know, one day I asked the sisters who were all dressed in hijab that how many of you have been forced to wear the hijab and no one put their hands up. And so one of the guys who was there says, that's because we're all sitting here. You know? <laughs> uh, it means people think that the men force the women. But to be honest with you, that's not actually the case. So big motivation. You need to be strong. When you want to achieve something, do it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Be steadfast and you should know when you're doing the right thing, you may face flack of people or you may face negative comments. Don't give up just because of the negative comments you're facing. If it's the right thing, persevere respectfully with all humbleness and humility. Keep on the right path. Yes, brother. Thank you so much. It's one of the biggest things to prepare for tomorrow. You need to know what the Almighty has told you. Your maker has told you something. And I always tell people, you've read thousands of books of how to become an accountant and a doctor and a so on and a so on. But you haven't yet read the book of life that would graduate you into the hereafter. So take a moment, read Revelation. Go and read it. Read it seriously. When you don't understand something, highlight it, put a line, so on. Go and ask someone who knows. Look, there's a verse here. How do I understand this? You know, I was uh, Googling just because someone told me that if you Google the translations of the Quran or some of the verses, you'll be surprised how many of those who intend harm upon Islam and the Muslims have taken over some of these translation sites whereby they, they send you up the wrong tree altogether as a Muslim. So they would interpret verses intentionally in a way that is absolutely unacceptable. And for you, it's just like an Islamic website. So it's important for you to know the source of your knowledge. When you go onto Sheikh Google, you need to understand that he's not actually a Sheikh. Yes, Google makes life so easy. But you know how many O's there are when you're searching? Have you seen? 
Subhanallah. You have so many different answers. You need someone to guide you to say, hey, look, is this legitimate or not? May Allah help us. Yes, sister. Uh, there is an email address you can ask me a question but there is a major major issue if i were to send you 2000 emails a day how many would you reply <laughs> that's it so so you have to make use of other scholars around you and a lot of other people because it's easy for me to say here's my email address but the problem is if you had to see my inbox you would actually freak out i cannot it's impossible to reply every single mail. So sometimes the admin replies, and if it's extremely urgent, it's vetted and it comes across. And if it's a follow-up, it actually does come across. And there's, there's a system I work by, but there's no guarantee you're going to get an answer from me. So don't just wait and say, I asked a question, but 10 years have passed. Come on, you can ask someone else, you know. <laughs> Within two gigabytes, he says. Sorry, say it again. Oh, there's a lot of authentic sites, mashallah, inshallah. We'll talk about it perhaps later on, inshallah, when we get a chance. And one of the good ways of doing things is just to check the site and to seek help from someone. Look, this is the site. Can you please go to it when you get a chance and let me know if it's okay? Uh, Jazakumullah khair. Yes. Uh, yes, sister. Brilliant, subhanAllah. Another case of how it is not so easy perhaps to live in a nation where you're in a minority, but your duty is to, uh, to be kind, to be good to people and so on. You know... Uh, I was amazed and impressed by some of the uh, videos that I saw online, uh, Australia and a few other countries where the non-Muslims were reaching out to Muslims in hijab completely. Well, you know, after what happened in, in, in one of those cafes or something, uh, someone did something and people know that, look, we've lived with the Muslims. And it was the interaction of the Muslims that has been positive for decades on end in Australia. For example, it's just one example that made the people realize, hang on, I know so many Muslims in my life. They're lovely people and they're being persecuted because of the actions of one bigot somewhere down the line. You know, someone who's misinterpreted the deen. So they said, you know, there was a hashtag saying what? Ride with me or something? Yeah. I'll ride with you. Exactly. What was that? That was because of people like, like us who have reached out to the non-Muslims at times when nothing was happening. So w when something happened, they understood these guys are decent people. They're just normal human beings. They've made different choices in life and perhaps they, they're quite passionate about their faith and so should we be. So what? Jewish, Christian, so what? Someone who doesn't have a faith. The reality is we are different, yes, but you know, you're living in Hong Kong. You need to reach out to everyone. They will reach out to you too. Trust me, they will reach out. But if we live a totally separated life, like, you know what? Uh, I, I have nothing to do with anyone else. The day anything happens, they have so much skepticism. There are so many questions that are unanswered. They don't even know who you are. Why would they support you? They don't even know what you stand for. Why would they actually answer on your behalf? But if you've been interacting at work and at school and everywhere else and public transport and you're courteous and you, you, you just have to live Islam, that's it. If you really live Islam, to be honest with you, they will respect you to the degree that if someone else wants to harm you, perhaps they would stand in between and say, hey, leave them alone. And I've seen it, I've seen it on, on these clips. You can actually go and have a peep on, you know, on YouTube. You won't be taking from my two gigs, so it's fine. <laughs> yes, uh, yes, sister. Continue doing a deed even if it's small is one of the best ways of preparing for tomorrow. To be honest with you, uh, the hadith says, "Khairul amali madi ma alayhi wa inqal." Uh, the best of deeds are those which are regularly done, even if they are small. Because, like I said, a small deed ha has a big impact if it's continuous. Conti we spoke about sins right at the beginning, but now we're talking of good deeds. So, if you do a good deed every single day, you read a little bit of the Quran, like the brother said, with the meaning, a slight bit. Inshallah, it will help you. It will help you in a huge way by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But uh, if, you're, if you're just going to read the Arabic of the Quran without the meaning of the Quran, trust me, yes, you get a reward for the recital, but you haven't re really known what your maker wants from you. And then come the people who say, hey, it's haram for you to look into the translation. You're just a layman. Well, the Quran was revealed for everyone. And you need to know, you will look into it. When you have a question, you will ask those who have knowledge. That's what it is. Okay, uh, how are we doing for time, Habibi? Uh, we're over time, but you can continue. By how much? By 10 minutes. By 10 gigabytes, okay. <laughs> uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us and grant us goodness and ease. We're over time, so I've really enjoyed myself here. Okay, the brother wants to say something. Thank you so much, Habibi. He's, he's saying something that I, I, I've always said, and mashallah, he's put it worded it slightly differently. But, assalamu alaikum actually means, 
I promise you I won't harm you. That's what it means. Assalamu alaikum means may the peace and of the Almighty be upon you and, and His blessings and His mercy. That's what you're saying. Which means I'm praying for you for peace. And if I'm praying for you for peace, I'd be the last person to snatch that peace away from you. Yeah, and with a smile, salam alaikum. <laughs> One guy actually thought it was a smile alaikum, you know? <laughs> it's not, it's not. It's a salam alaikum. <laughs> you gotta smile, mashallah. So, so you have to smile. You greet someone with peace because you don't harm them. You're guaranteeing them that I will not harm you. So, so you're at peace. But the biggest hypocrites are those who greet you, salam alaikum, and they've got a dagger in you as they're hugging you. You know, they poke you. And what's that? May Allah subhanahu wa taala not do that to us. So, to be sincere when you talk to people, to be to be kind and loving, to reach out to people. You know, it's not just you, you, your race, your clique, your little family. We're actually one huge family on the globe. And we need to look after this entire family. And we need to make sure that when we leave the earth, we've left it a slightly better place, even if it means in our little circle that we could. Because if I'm based, for example, in Hong Kong, either in Chai Wan or in Wan Chai, right? There's a difference between the two. <laughs> uh, if I'm based there, I need to have left a mark at least where I was. It will become two chai, not just one. Okay? So, because I left something good. You know, chai is a cup of tea for me. I don't know about you guys, right? So, from one, we made it two, alhamdulillah. But if I leave and there's only half a chai, there's a problem. <laughs> May Allah forgive us. Obviously, that's me and my stale, lame jokes, isn't it? <laughs> Shukran. It's really been absolutely awesome. The, the, the last comment we'll take is from the sister here, inshallah. Salaam wa rahmatullah. I mean, shukran, shukran, uh, uh, mashallah, barakallah fiqh. And I appreciate the fact that you've uh, braved it to say what you've just said. Can I ask you one or two questions? Do you follow their example? You try. Are uh, you try? Are they still alive? Okay, so alhamdulillah, Allah bless them and grant them goodness and ease. What I learned from you and what you've just said now is, uh, look at the sister. She's not just a young kid, but she's talking about the goodness of her own parents. How many of us, and I'm not going to talk about your parents, about you, your children or future children, wouldn't you be inspired to lead a life that tomorrow someone can say something similar to this about you, that I'm inspired by my own parents, they give out charity, they're good and they're kind, and, and really I, I pray that Allah grant them Jannah. Look at this. So the inspiration I would receive, I would get from this is, let me lead my life in a way that my kids can say the same. Especially the day I'm gone, you know. <laughs> they shouldn't say, ooh, dad should have gone 10 years back. And, you know. <laughs> May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. This is called leaving a mark. You leave a mark. And really that's apt to end today's session, inshallah, where the future, what we're preparing for, you know, tomorrow, we want to do today, inshallah, what will help us tomorrow and in the future in all the possible ways. Uh, this was just an introduction to the topic because in one hour, uh, we can just sort of talk to each other and, uh, try and motivate each other. I hope you've benefited. I have too from a lot of the blessed input that's come from you guys. And I apologize for taking a few more gigabytes of your time. But Alhamdulillah. Jazakumullah khair. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.